make America safe again. And yes, together, we will make America great again. In just one four-year term, Donald Trump has done as much to transform his country as any president in living memory, simply by being himself. Now, every president has a complex legacy, but some of them, fairly or not, are remembered for one great embarrassment or disaster, something you can sum up in a single word. Richard Nixon, Watergate. Bill Clinton, Lubinsky. George W. Bush, Iraq. With Donald Trump, it's different. You can take any given month, week, or even day of the Trump presidency and find something that on its own could have defined an entire era. Twitter, Russia, Charlottesville, coronavirus, bleach. Right, and then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute. Golf, impeachment, twice. And now, insurrection. A violent assault on the Capitol by Trump supporters literally baying for blood. So how did we get here? The Trump era began with one of the strangest elections in American history. One that Trump himself called a landslide, even though he lost the popular vote by nearly three million and just scraped a victory in the Electoral College. At his inauguration, Trump took a trip to the dark side, ranting about American carnage. This American carnage stops right here. And insisting his presidency would be based on the chauvinistic principle of America first. America first. George W. Bush says to me, well, that was some weird shit. But the next morning, Trump wasn't exactly riding high. Enraged by reports of a smaller than expected crowd, he sent press secretary Sean Spicer to tell journalists, This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period. It wasn't. But no problem. As Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway put it, Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts. A phrase that neatly defined the Trump administration's relationship with reality. An exhausting equilibrium quickly set in. The president driving the day with unhinged tweets, the administration constantly fighting rearguard actions to try and keep control, with Washington and the media battling to keep up. It felt every day as if the administration's wheels were about to come off. And yet, somehow, it kept barreling remorselessly forward. All the while, the White House was making good on Trump's extreme promises. Among those was a ban on all Muslims coming to the United States. Just a week into his presidency, Trump issued an executive order freezing refugee admissions for 120 days. I'm establishing new vetting measures to keep radical Islamic terrorists out of the United States of America. Denying entry to the US for citizens of seven Muslim-majority countries. The order unleashed furious protests at major airports, setting a pattern for the next four years. Back at the White House, Trump kicked out the hapless Sean Spicer and replaced him with Anthony Scaramucci, a self-proclaimed front-stabber who was fired after 11 days thanks to a New Yorker interview in which he character-assassinated half the president's senior advisers. Then there was the border wall, Trump's original signature issue. He arrived at the White House still insisting that Mexico would pay for it, though former Mexican president Vincente Fox Quesada had other ideas. First, we're not paying for that f***ing wall. The wall was a nightmare for the administration from the off. Yeah, excuse me, excuse me, Congress excuse me, yet, are you ready? Sorry. Are you ready? The wall is peanuts compared to what the value of this trade deal is to the United States. Not long after would come the sight of children separated from their families and locked in cages at the Mexican border. Some have not been reunited with their parents to this day. Trump relentlessly demanded funding for it from Congress. I will get it built. Leading to the longest government shutdown in history after he lost the midterm elections at the end of 2018 and Nancy Pelosi refused to hand the money over. Thank you all for making the future better for all of America's children. By the end of his presidency, only a few hundred miles had been built along the 2,000 mile frontier. Another thing that defined the administration from the start, Russia. Just three weeks after he was sworn in, Trump lost his national security advisor, Michael Flynn, who admitted lying to Mike Pence and the FBI about his conversations with the Russian ambassador. 
The authorities had been monitoring contacts between the Trump team and Russian counterparts for months. But it was Flynn's departure that blew it wide open and set in motion a chain of events that would eventually culminate in Trump's first impeachment. In the meantime, events were moving at breakneck speed. Trump had arrived with a golden opportunity to leave a permanent legacy, an open seat on the Supreme Court. It had been vacant for the best part of a year thanks to Senate Republicans, who refused to vote on Barack Obama's nominee on the farcical pretext that it was an election year. Trump put forward an orthodox conservative choice, soft-spoken Neil Gorsuch. It took a civil war for this country to win. Who was only installed on the bench after a rule change, allowing the Senate to confirm him by a simple majority. Trump went on to nominate two more justices, Brett Kavanaugh, whose hearings descended into a livid partisan battle over historic sexual assault allegations. I denied the allegation immediately, categorically, and unequivocally. And Amy Coney Barrett, whom Republicans voted to confirm under the very same circumstances in which they had refused Obama's nominee. I thank the president for entrusting me with this profound responsibility. For all his talk of America first, Trump stood out boldly on the international stage. After a gas attack in Syria shocked the world, he ordered a missile strike on Bashar al-Assad's chemical weapons sites. Assad choked out the lives of helpless men, women and children. He posed with the leaders of Egypt and Saudi Arabia and appointed his son-in-law Jared Kushner to mastermind a new peace between Israel and Palestine, a process that ended with several Arab countries normalising their ties with the Jewish state. Trump backed out of the hard-won Iran nuclear deal and the Paris Climate Agreement. The Iranian regime is the leading state sponsor of terror. He also antagonised the North Korean supreme leader, Kim Jong-un, nicknaming him Rocket Man and boasting that he had the larger of the two men's nuclear buttons. He definitely likes sending rockets up, doesn't he? That's why I call him Rocket Man. Then came a stunning turnaround in their relationship with Mr. Trump actually visiting North Korean territory for a smiling photo shoot. But like many other Trump initiatives, the attempt to build and maintain a rapport ran into the ground before long. And today, Kim is still shoring up his nuclear deterrent. Meanwhile, Trump staged a North Korea-esque military parade for the 4th of July 2019. But the so-called salute to America was a washout, drenched by a thunderstorm as tanks too heavy for Washington's roads sat redundantly on display. Then came one of Trump's most crushing policy failures. Republicans had been promising for years to abolish Obamacare, the health care overhaul passed in 2010. They had never come up with a replacement, but as far as their base was concerned, that didn't matter. Mr Trump managed to get a repeal bill to the floor of the Senate. Tonight I am also calling on this Congress to repeal and replace Obamacare. And it looked like it might pass, until it was shot down by three Republican senators. One of them was the legendary John McCain, who dramatically voted no at the very last minute. He died within a year, and Trump refused to attend the funeral of a man he despised as a, quote, loser. For the rest of his presidency, Trump said he would have a replacement health care plan ready in about two weeks. It never materialised. Instead, much of Trump's term was spent grappling with the investigation into his ties to Russia, which many of his enemies thought might bring his presidency to an end. Impeach him. Think of this. Impeachment. Impeachment. A witch hunt. When it came out, Robert Mueller's report was more equivocal than the president's enemies expected or hoped. We would, would not reach a determination one way or the other about whether the president committed a crime. But despite what Trump's Attorney General Bill Barr said... He had not made the determination that there was a crime. It did not exonerate him, and several of his associates were indicted along the way for their Russian connections and for lying to Congress while the investigation unfolded. And then, out of the ashes, came the president's first impeachment. When it emerged that Trump had tried to pressure the Ukrainian government into investigating the Biden family, House Democrats embarked on an investigation that Trump dismissed as a scam and a witch hunt. When they look at the information, it's a joke. Impeachment for that? When the Senate began the impeachment trial, the Republican leadership decided it would not call any further witnesses. 
There were hopes that at least a few from the GOP would cross the floor to convict the president of abusing his power. But in the end, only one of them did. Former presidential candidate and Trump dissident Mitt Romney. The president is guilty of an appalling abuse of public trust. Trump was acquitted on the 5th of February 2020. He might have thought he was out of the woods, but a new catastrophe was already underway. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. Two weeks earlier, the Centers for Disease Control had confirmed the US's first reported case of COVID-19 in a 35-year-old man who had traveled back from China's Wuhan province to Washington state. Asked whether he was concerned, Trump said, it's one person coming in from China. Yeah, very well under control in our country. He repeated that the virus was under control throughout February, promising it would die out in the spring. And the risk to the American people remains very low. But by March, the US death toll was exploding. As the virus tore across the country through 2020, Trump repeatedly played down the threat while promoting treatments unsupported by science. At one point, suggesting people could stave it off by drinking bleach. Right, and then I see the disinfectant, where it knocks it out in a minute. When the summer brought something of a lull in case numbers, Trump encouraged governors to open up their states. Open up your state! And some of them did. But come the autumn, the numbers surged again, and they were rising even more steeply by the end of the year when Trump himself contracted a nasty case. In the middle of all this came another kind of reckoning. The police killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, in mind-blowingly cruel circumstances, kicked off a summer of protests and riots unlike anything seen in at least a generation. Cities across the country were hit with anti-racism and anti-police demonstrations, some of which turned violent, especially in Portland, Oregon, where hardline left-wingers clashed with police for weeks on end. At one point, Trump's Homeland Security Secretary sent in unidentified troops to grab people off the street without explanation and hold them without charge. Similarly, authoritarian tactics were deployed right outside the White House, where armed forces cobbled together from different agencies used tear gas to clear Black Lives Matter protesters out of Trump's way as he walked across Lafayette Square to pose for a photo shoot with a Bible. That show of brute force against Trump's dissenters chimed with the single most disturbing theme of his presidency. Since the beginning of his presidential campaign, Trump had been celebrated by far-right extremists and white nationalists who saw in him the potential to finally enact explicitly racist policies and destroy institutions that kept them from getting their way. When he triumphed over Hillary Clinton, footage from a neo-Nazi conference in Washington showed a room of men shouting, Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! and giving Zeke Heil salutes. And in the summer of 2017, a medley of racial extremists held a rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, staging a torchlight rally where they chanted, Jews will not replace us. You will not replace us! A counter-protest ensued the next day, and in the resulting violence, one neo-Nazi drove his car into the crowd, killing a young woman. Professing his regret over the incident, Mr. Trump said there were very fine people on both sides. He settled quickly into this habit of winking and nudging at dangerous elements in American society staying just within the bounds of plausible deniability, depending on your point of view, that is. At a debate with Joe Biden, he was asked to denounce the violent, racist and misogynistic Proud Boys. He declined, instead telling them to... My proud proud boy, Boys, God. stand back and stand by, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left. And then, after a bout with the coronavirus that saw him hospitalised at Walter Reed Medical Centre, Donald Trump lost the election to Joe Biden. CNN projects Joseph R. Biden Jr. is elected the 46th president of the United States. Having spent months predicting it would be stolen thanks to imagined mail-in ballot fraud, Trump refused to accept his defeat. Instead, 
He barraged the country with furious disinformation. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. And dispatched a team of lawyers to file baseless lawsuits in states he narrowly lost. Their crusade was a spectacular failure. Judge after judge rejected their cases as farcical and incompetent. There's no way we lost Georgia, there's no way. And a press conference held outside a Philadelphia landscaping company sealed the impression of a sore loser sending out his most unhinged lieutenants to fight a humiliatingly futile battle. Seems to me somebody from the Democratic National Committee sent out a little note that said, don't let the Republicans look at those mail-in ballots. In the end, even Trump's three Supreme Court justices disappointed him. Supreme Court moments ago, speaking and flat out rejecting President Trump's last ditch effort to steal the election from Joe Biden. His hopes were dashed and Joe Biden's inauguration began drawing ever closer. I am truly confident together, together, we can get this done. What happened next was so extreme that it's nearly eclipsed everything that preceded it. At the last minute, the Trump presidency finally hit rock bottom. As Congress assembled to officially certify the election result on January the 6th, Trump addressed a crowd of livid supporters. We're going to walk down and I'll be there with you to the Capitol because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength. He encouraged them to take their anger to the Capitol, and they did. Smashing their way into the building, violently attacking the overwhelmed Capitol Police, and hunting the corridors for Democrats and other so-called traces. Fortunately, both houses of Congress were successfully sheltered in secure areas. With improvised explosive devices later found in the building and a makeshift gallows assembled outside, what might have happened scarcely bears thinking about. The aftermath is like nothing seen in the US before. Congress has impeached Trump for a second time for helping to incite a riot against its very democracy. For Joe Biden's inauguration, the Capitol was filled with National Guard troops in case of violence. The US may be finally shaking Trump off, but it's hardly the country it was in 2016. Trump and Trumpism have changed everything. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have died from a virus that could have been contained. And the paranoid racist grievances that Trump harnessed to get elected are now more dangerous than ever. Joe Biden has talked about healing the soul of America. To heal, we must remember. But after four years of Trump, it seems not everyone in America is ready to be healed just yet. My fellow Americans, this is America's day. This is democracy's day. A day of history and hope, of renewal and resolve. Through a crucible for the ages, America has been tested anew, and America has risen to the challenge.